Only what is finite can have a centre. What you are is infinite being, that which is without dimension. A body and mind with desires becomes a body and a mind without desires. But if the identification continues, the problem continues. With the cessation of imagination and desire, the drive to becoming ceases. And being this or being that merges into pure being. Thoughts appear as a necessary function in the human organism. The organism does not decide to create them any more than it decides to breathe. They are sourced from that which sustains and supports the organism. To believe that you can stop your thoughts presupposes that you initiate them. Why don't you provide some sort of instruction so we can understand what must be done? To be free from the obsession with what's next is all the instruction necessary. You are waiting for the arrival of something that is already present. This is a trap with no exits, other than directly seeing the construction of the trap. The senses are the gateways to the waking world. When they are shut down, what continues are thoughts and imaginations. The subtle world revealed in dreams. Thoughts and imaginations were also present during wakefulness, but now they take centre stage. When these two are shut, what remains is the perceiving, without any content to perceive. In this state, the bodily functions are set to a default threshold, just enough so that the body remains enlivened and does not begin to decay. Perceiving is neutral, whereas the brain in the body is self-centric. The personal idea, this I, is the perfume of the self-centricity.
The physical body, while present in the waking state, is absent in the dream state. But the witnessing, pure awareness, is present in both and is therefore the constant factor. In the same way, in the state of deep sleep, there is the witnessing of that state where phenomena are absent. Therefore, witnessing is ever-present, unwavering, like a candle in a windless room. Enlightenment is a return to that point of view that was operative prior to the arising of self-consciousness. It is unitive in its very nature. As self-consciousness arises spontaneously, its subsistence that is, enlightenment, also arises spontaneously. In that regard, there is no way to obtain it, as there are as many ways as there are teachers of ways. The word rice cannot fill your stomach. Words can be strung together endlessly, but they too ultimately do not provide sustenance. They fail to convey the truth as a menu fails to convey flavour. It need not be that complicated. I points to an experience which is direct, immediate, and requires no interpretation or translation. I am is the portal, on one side leading to I am this, and on the other, back to I. Make a firm decision to traverse the portal and then see if any more is required. Every I am this or I am that uses I am as its foundation. I am is the ultimate fact. What am I 
is the ultimate question. The life process itself starts with a lifeless, unfertilized egg and ends at what is called death with another lifeless form. In between these two points, the conscious life energy has introduced itself. It has taken a body that was created by the fertilization of the egg as its host and its instrument. There are no goals that are not mind created. What you strive for is what you imagine you must strive for. With the cessation of striving, what needs to arrive, arrives. Searching is movement and therefore can never find stillness, the source of all movement. Only this silent stillness can speak about the not knowable. The conscious life energy functions through various forms according to their respective natures and capabilities. There is no unique entity, no you and no me. Just as thoughts come to you, the world comes to you. They arrive at your address. Clarifying what this address is constitutes what Wu Sin talks about. Nothing more. The world is experienced. The body is experienced. The mind is experienced and the life stream is experienced. On a more subtle level, the absence of these is experienced. But what is it that is experiencing? You are the experiencing which can't be known in the traditional sense. Experiencing is ineffable. Wu Sin can't convey his experiencing of an apple or a sunset to anyone. Yet, it is the very essence of living.
Whereas existence is singular, it can take on an infinite number of shapes. The nature of unity is this existence, consciousness and fullness. Whereas the nature of the world emanating from this unity is name and form. The latter is not so much an illusion as it is a distortion. The reality we perceive in our everyday waking consciousness is a distortion, much as a stick in water appears broken because of the refracting light. It is that out of which the sense of the personal I arises and into which it disappears. Mind is the screen onto which images are projected. Yet without light, the images cannot be seen. Language is the instrument of the mind, as the mind in time and the body in space are the instruments of the conscious life energy. No mind cannot be known. The end of questions is the end of mind, because mind is the source of all questions. Yet, since mind cannot register its own absence, how is this to be known? Whatever the experience is, true or false, the fact of experiencing is undeniable. What is experienced is the content of consciousness. It is the involvement with every this appearing to that. The root experience is I am, from which all else emanates. You want to use your intellect to understand, but this is like drinking tea with a fork. You want to escape your prison, but you haven't discerned that the thinking you're in prison is the prison. You have failed to realise that all you're running after is, in fact, running away. Any reinforcement of the idea of a searching entity is movement away from what you claim you want. 
As a person, your existence is momentary. In another moment, you might easily become what amounts to another person. Remove the attention from what is personal and what reveals itself is the source, without which neither light nor darkness could be cognized. As a prism emits colours without doing anything, you emit the world and its activities without doing anything. This is verifiable. When you are not, where is the world? In the absence of body consciousness, what can you say about the world? Can't you see that body consciousness and world consciousness rise and set together? That which perceives each prior to both is what you are. To say that you are conscious of yourself implies that there are two. First, there is the consciousness. Then there is yourself, that which you are conscious of. There is consciousness, the subjective and its object, yourself. Which are you? Objectification is a process of exteriorization. It is the placement of impermanent phenomena outside oneself. One who knows a source as source and appearance as appearance, takes their stand outside of outside. One responds, not me, not mine, to all appearances. Perfection is discerned in the instant that one releases all notions of what it's supposed to look like. There is never a problem in the outside world. All problems are in the mind.
the mind is like the moon. It only shines by reflected light. When the attention remains fixed on it, the light source, the mind and its machinations become immaterial. Matter and mind are not separate. They are aspects of the conscious life energy. Mind is in time, whereas matter is of time and space. Both appear and disappear as expressions of it. Stated differently, mind constitutes a phenomena of consciousness. Form is objectified mind. Me is reified form. Only that which has been created needs to be maintained in order to avoid destruction. Self-consciousness is such a maintenance-driven creation. Therefore, all efforts to be rid of it merely reinforce a sense of identification with it. Thus, maintaining it. Can you discern that nothing will make you more of what you already are? Is there any need to make water wetter? Is there really a person who from an inside experiences something outside itself? Or is there only experiencing wherein the person is the experience? Abiding in oneness means having no needs. How can you need what is already part of you? In separation, that which fulfills the needs always resides outside. To the mechanism of personality, this here now is always insufficient. This here now 
is the opposite of universality and eternity. Whereas a healthy mind oscillates between the two poles, the unhealthy mind is fixated on that, there, then. What could be selfish about wanting to cease enriching what is false? Me must be seen to be imagination. If me is imagination, then all the of me's, that is, all the minds, a likewise imagination. When the situation is examined thoroughly, it is discerned that there is no basis for selecting one appearance out of the totality and labelling it as me. As such, there is no me who receives enlightenment. When there is no one home to accept the delivery, what can be delivered? The answer cannot be located by thinking. How many more months, years, or decades will it take until you see the futility of this approach? Stop trying to quench this thirst by drinking the sound of water. Turn away from thinking. That's it. There is no need for practices per se. Just pondering these words and trying to grasp their full meaning is sufficient for returning. Returning means going back to the source and support of everything and resting there. In that, the misconception that there ever was a thinker, a doer, a perceiver, and an enjoyer simply disappears. Sooner or later, you are bound to discover that if you really want to end the searching, you must return the way that you came. You can never find the truth because this you as an entity is a lie. A lie can never reveal what is true. 
It's like living with ash in your eye. You can never see clearly. For you to see things as they really are requires the removal of this ash, which is the cessation of one's preoccupation with a seeming self. We experience consciousness of phenomena, that is, physical objects or mental thoughts. Can there be a line of demarcation between consciousness and phenomena in that experience? Consciousness can well exist all alone, without phenomena. But phenomena can never exist without consciousness. Therefore, it is the support of all. All is consciousness. The knowing that Wu Sin is speaking about is not the same as knowing the world. It is not a physical or sensual or mental activity that's done by body, sense or mind. This is the knowing of any and all phenomena that appear in the field of consciousness. It illuminates the field absent of any illuminator. It does not begin, nor does it end. It is. As silent knowing, it is completely detached from the thinking mind, the perceiving senses, the doing body, or the happy or unhappy person. Whatever you perceive is there in the field of knowing. But it is not you. So stop assuming that you are something inside the field. To work on reducing the hold of the mind is not the solution. 
Imagine if you have a brother-in-law who comes to your house every day drunk and throws up on your floor. The solution to the problem is not for him to come less frequently. Some have suggested the approach of watching the mind. But how can paying attention to the mind cure the problem of paying attention to the mind? Your mind holds sway over you because you have granted it an audience. Wu Sin suggests that you deny it an audience.